All right, so Nikon told me absolutely nothing about this camera. They gave me no briefing on it, and a few weeks later, here we are. This is the Nikon Z8, and to my surprise, it's not a potato. It's actually a really good camera. Now with that out of the way, I'm going to switch over to this camera and start shooting with this so you can see what this looks like. All right, we're shooting on the Z8 right now. This is 8K, H265, 10-bit 422, and I'm shooting an N-Log so you can kind of see what it looks like when you grade it. Uh, it looks good. For this type of a scenario, you might want to use it for talking head, and this is kind of what it looks like. It's doing some good eye tracking. I wouldn't really call this my full review on this camera. It's kind of more my thoughts just on using the camera for a couple of weeks. Uh, the only thing I really cared to focus on while I had this camera was obviously what it's like for eye autofocus tracking in photo and video, uh, what it's like to shoot with as far as what it's like in the hand, uh, image quality, editing the raw photos, and of course, shooting some 8K 60p raw video. And this is one of the only non-cinema cameras that I know of that can shoot internal raw 12-bit 8K 60p video besides its older brother, the Z9. And they actually had to fight right in court to do this, and they actually won, so this camera can do it. So I'm sure this isn't your first time watching a review on this camera, and if it is, well, this is basically a smaller, lighter version of Nikon's flagship, the Z9. It's rocking a 45.7 megapixel full-frame stack sensor, and it's got such a fast readout that they didn't put a mechanical shutter in this camera. It's just electronic. It has in-body stabilization up to six stops, 493 phase detect autofocus points, 20 frames per second burst shooting when you're doing raw and JPEG. And it also has a mode that lets you shoot up to 120 frames per second in a lower res JPEG, which is something unique I've never seen in any camera before. And that would be awesome if you're doing sports or action and you needed to pinpoint capture that moment. Um, it's pretty cool that it does that. And when it comes to video, as I mentioned, this camera can do 8K 60p 12-bit internal RAW, and it can do 4K 120 frames per second. It also has the option of shooting 12-bit 4K ProRes RAW. It can also do 10-bit ProRes HQ and 10-bit 422H265. So this camera is really impressive for video specs, and that's not something you'd think you'd get from Nikon. Um, it's rocking one CF Express B card slot, one UHS-2 card slot. But in order to get the most out of this camera, you're going to want a CF Express B card. So shooting with this camera has kind of been a different experience for me. I'll say that I love how the camera feels in the hand, but it's definitely not a light compact mirrorless camera. It feels pretty heavy. It comes in at around 910 grams and it feels more like I'm holding a big DSLR, especially with the beefy 24 to 70 f 2.8 lens I had on it. Um, I feel like this camera is all business. So you pick it up, it's time to do work. And this is not the camera you pick up just to shoot for fun. Now, obviously you could, but to me, it just feels like all business. The button placement took a little bit of time to get used to, and that's because I haven't shot with Nikon in ages. So to change ISO, white balance, and different modes, you actually have to hold that button down while scrolling the command dial. Um, uh, if you always shoot with Nikon, then that's normal, and it's not something you need to get used to, but it's just something I thought I'd mention because I'm not used to it. So once I figured out the autofocus system for shooting photos and videos, I kind of just left it on 3D tracking and it did a really good job, but I also put it into wide area too, just to see how well it would track. Um, I'm doing that right now. I'm in wide right now just to see how it's tracking in the frame. Um, I also like that you have the option to switch which eye that the camera's focusing on just by choosing it on the joystick. I haven't seen that on any other camera because usually it just automatically selects the eye. Um, this camera can shoot up to 20 frames per second in RAW and JPEG, like I mentioned. And if you leave it in high efficiency RAW using the CF Express B card, you can literally hold the shutter button down and not really outrun the buffer, which is crazy. Now, if you do want to have redundancy and you want to back up to an SD card at the same time, you're going to be limited to the speed of the SD card. And so once I put a UHS-2 card in the camera, I was limited to about 45 shots until I hit the buffer. And I feel like this is a professional camera, especially for the speed it has. I feel like it should have had two CF Express B cards, but whatever. Um, this camera does have crazy burst rates, um, and I would never typically shoot this way, but for these YouTube reviews, I kind of want to show off what it can do, and it's pretty crazy. This camera does have pretty solid autofocus, and it does have all the same smart subject detection modes like all the cameras are getting, so animal, plane, car, stuff like that. Um, I was pretty impressed with the eye tracking, although I will say... 
Uh, the eye box tracking gave me the confidence that it was amazing and it looked good on the back of the camera. But when looking back at some of the shots, um, there was a lot of shots slightly out of focus. Now that could be my autofocus settings. Uh, I just left everything in default because I felt like that was just the best. It was doing a good job. Um, this kind of reminds me of last generation Fuji autofocus. So that said, it's not horrible. Um, and it could be some of the locations and lighting I was shooting in, but I did notice it did miss quite often. the video <laughs> i've already mentioned this like three times but this camera does shoot 12-bit 8k internal raw video and it's called nraw and that's nikon's proprietary raw video compression um, it also has n-log and when you're shooting an n-log uh, it has a dual native iso of 800 and 4000 and i feel like that's the perfect dual native iso for a camera i didn't do a ton of low light video tests but i did get some stuff uh shot some stuff in a pool at night and i did bump the iso a bit um, but the video options in this camera are pretty straightforward. They make it really easy, but because of that, you don't actually have many options to change bit rates. For raw video, just have kind of like a normal or high quality option. And when it comes to the 4K in ProRes or H.265, you can choose to shoot it with oversampling or not. Um, it does oversample from 8K, so it looks amazing. Um, I did shoot some oversampled 4K 120 frames per second, 10 bit 422, and it actually looked really nice. Now, one thing to keep in mind, this is all full frame. There's no crops. It's doing all these frame rates and resolutions at full frame. And uh, the image coming off this camera looks great. And when you're shooting in RAW, you're going to notice there's a little bit more noise, but you also get a little bit more dynamic range. And in all of the footage that I shot, I'm just using the official LUT from Nikon. So it's the N-Log to Rec. 709. And that's kind of what I've been showing you with a few tweaks. Okay, so I quickly just want to jump into Resolve here and show you what it's like to work with these Nikon RAW files. They come in as NEV files and alongside them, you're going to get a proxy file, an MP4. I separated them, but when you get them on the card, they're going to be side by side. So it's kind of cool that it makes a proxy. You don't have to turn the setting on in camera. It just automatically does it. So coming into Resolve here, this is slightly different than working with Blackmagic or Red Raw. You don't have any ISO control, but if we set this to clip, you're going to see we do have our color temperature adjustments, our exposure adjustments. I'm not sure if this exposure adjustment is the same as working with ISO, but we do get full white balance control. So if you messed up your white balance, you could fix that in post. They do show up as Rec 2020. I'm just going to leave it like that for now. And our gamma as N-Log, so we can use the official LUT. If we come in here and drop the official Nikon N-Log to Rec 709 LUT, we can apply that and you can see what that looks like here. This is a very dynamic and contrasty scene, so this does look a little bit too dark, but I probably underexposed it a little bit too much and my color temperature was a little bit too warm. So this is kind of good because I can show you what it's like to fix the white balance after the fact. And I think fluorescent looks the best for this type of scene, but you can see the skin tones are pretty nice. And if we have to, we can still warm this up a little bit more just through our white balance adjustment. So that looks actually really nice. And I'll come in here and make a few more adjustments, bump the gain up here. Now, as you can see, I was exposing for skin tone. So we do have a lot of shadow information here. And if we try and pull those shadows out, you're going to see how much noise there is. But you can pull those shadows out. They start to turn a little green. And this is because I was underexposed a little bit. But we could come in here and adjust our shadows and pull some of that green out. And alongside that, we could do some noise reduction. But if we play this back, you're going to see how much noise there is. But I would never lift the shadows quite that much. I'm going to put them back down to where they were. And uh, they're actually okay here. They're not clipping. Now, if I was to put this LUT on a properly exposed image like this, it looks a lot better on an image where it's properly exposed. So one of the main reasons why you might want to shoot raw on this camera is just the overall dynamic range, especially when it comes to highlight recovery. As you can see, I'm perfectly exposed here. I don't have any highlights blown out, but if you did want to pull these down more, you can start to recover a little bit more detail in the highlights. You can see power lines and things like that. Um, we can also push the highlights without clipping them too, which is nice because we did have that properly exposed image. And the other reason why you might want to shoot raw is for skin tones. You're going to have a lot more color information when you shoot 12 bit raw and you can push and pull the skin tones. You can move it around. You can do basically anything you want with these raw files. 
um, and then you have a lot more room to do stuff in post. Now, when it comes to rolling shutter, this camera is excellent, and that's because it has that really fast stack sensor that's inside of it. Uh, I never noticed really any issues with the 8K or the oversampled 4K. It looks really good, and uh, obviously that's not a scientific test, but just looking back at the footage where I'm panning the camera back and forth like an idiot, it looked really good. And when it comes to the autofocus in video, I was also really impressed with how well it did. I played around with some of the focus zones and different focus box sizes. I actually really like that you can customize the focus box and make it any size you want. I kind of wish more cameras actually would let you do that. And obviously you can see I'm using it here. Oh, the uh, hot card warning came on. Uh, we're at 18 minutes now. And that's just because I've been blabbing on. This video is probably not at 18 minutes yet, but um, this is good timing because I want to talk about the overheating. Uh, obviously this camera has no fan in it. And when I was shooting 8K raw video, I was curious to see what kind of overheating issues we'd have. We're not even shooting in raw right now. Um, the camera actually hasn't overheated. It's just the card that says it's hot. And I obviously didn't have the patience to sit and test every single video resolution and frame rate. I'm sure Gerald Undone has that in his review. But in 8K 24P, it recorded for about one hour and 45 minutes till the battery died. I did get some uh, hot card warnings and an overheating warning, but it never actually shut off. Um, in 8K 60P, it actually only recorded to about 35 minutes before it overheated. And uh, again, these are all in raw video. So obviously it's working a lot harder. And I also had to reformat the card a few times because... Um, I have a 650 gig card in this camera, but it only would record for like 15 minutes till it was full. The camera also gives you a few other warnings as well, but when the hot card light comes on, the hot camera light comes on, it will give you actually a countdown um, when it can't take anymore, basically. And it's kind of nice to see. It's a little scary, but at least you know what's going on. But basically from what I noticed, if you shoot 24 frames per second in any resolution, you probably won't have much overheating issues. But again, that depends on your ambient temperature. And if you're shooting in a hot climate, I can't tell you how long you're going to get. Overall, this is an amazing camera and I had a really great time shooting with it. I feel like a lot of people are kind of sleeping on Nikon right now um, because this camera is basically in direct competition with the Sony A1, uh, the Canon R5, R5C probably is a little bit what it's closer to. Um, but if you do shoot Nikon and you've been eyeing up the Z9 before this came out, I feel like this is actually probably a better option for you unless you need uh, the better battery life on the Z9 because it does have that bigger uh, grip battery. And when it comes to autofocus, which is the only area I feel like this camera could do a little bit better in, um, don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but it's not really up to like the Sony A1 or the A7R5 level. I just found that it had too many images slightly out of focus, especially for how confident the on-screen eye box was showing. And I was actually kind of surprised when I look back at some of the images. Now, this could just be the lens. It could be my default autofocus settings I was using, um, but it's just something I notice. And when it comes to the specs and features for the money, the Z8 is actually incredible, especially since it's basically a mini Z9 for $1,500 less. This camera does come in though at 4,000 USD and that kind of feels a little expensive, but it's also reasonable for everything you're getting. You're getting a pro mirrorless camera and basically cinema camera features. Um, I mean, it's actually a pretty good price. So my big question though, is if you do shoot a lot of video, is Nikon even on your radar? Because I feel like most people are gonna still pick Canon, Sony, or Blackmagic, uh, even though this camera does have insane cinema camera video specs. But I guess it's just kind of that weird stigma of Nikon not really being known for video. All that said, uh, I don't think I'll be switching to Nikon anytime soon. I'm just too invested in other camera systems, but it was cool to try it out, put it through its paces and see what Nikon's bringing to the game for a pro mirrorless camera in 2023. Um, I'm kind of curious what you guys think about this camera. Is it something you've kind of been dreaming of? Because it does have kind of everything we've wanted in a camera besides the flip out screen for the video shooters. But uh, thanks for Nikon for lending this out to me and let me try it out for a couple of weeks. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike this video, give it a thumbs down twice. Don't forget to hit that notification bell and I'll see you guys in the next one. Shoots on Nikon. Oh no, no. I got two potato boxes on my eye. <laughs> 12 Brit. Man, someday I'll get good at YouTube. I look kind of tanned in this. Nikon's got that skin tone. A tan tone. This camera does have a newel, a newel, a newel native, a dual native. Camera warning after the hot card. Uh, uh, why can't I say hot card? From how confident you feel like you're shooting with the screen box on the camera. Well, that hot card warning is still on, but we have not yet seen the overheating light. So we're still going 26 minutes in, 8K video. This is the end of the video though. So I'll see you guys later. That is an so insane buffer.